I'm sitting here with Clint Hawking, who's the creative director on Far Cry 2. Tell us, what's it like to take over someone else's game and make a sequel of it? Well, I guess it's really, really great if it's a great game that you have to start with. Uh, uh, our mandate from the very beginning was to, to make a top-notch PC sequel to what was unquestionably you know, one, of the, one of the top PC games uh, of its time. And, uh, and that's what we set out to do, and I think, you know, uh, two year, more than two years I've been working on this game now. Um, I think I'm, I'm confident to say that I think we've uh, lived up to the expectations that that game creates, uh, which were pretty big expectations, big shoes to fill. Uh, it's been exhilarating to be able to work on something as challenging um, at the same time as, as promising as, as, uh, as a title uh, as the original Far Cry. Because the, the, the comparison to, to Crytek's new title, Crisis, is, is ine inevitable. Uh, everyone's going to compare Far Cry 2 to, to that game. But, but it looks pretty different from, from what you would think uh, uh, a new Far Cry, or, or Crisis for that matter. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the different decisions you made to make it look different? Well, I mean, like you say, it's, it's, the games are very hard to compare just because so many things in Far Cry 2 are so different. Um, I think the main reason they're so different and the main reason we decided to to do what we did was that we looked at Far Cry and we said what are the most important things in this game? Is it is it uh, mutants on a jungle island? No. The most important thing for us was that the game was exotic. It really had this feeling of of going somewhere that you've never been before, but somewhere that you really believe exists somewhere that's real somewhere that you know is there's some south pacific island with white sandy beaches and palm trees and all of that stuff and you know it's real but you're never going to get to go there probably unless you're really a lot richer than i am um and that was a, a really powerful feeling and one of the problems with for us with just saying okay we go back to a jungle tropical island in the south pacific is that you know you've been there before you've played far cry you maybe you've played some of the far cry console games uh you've uh you, maybe you played just cause or or Uh, Boiling Point or some of these games that are in a tropical jungle. Uh, you've watched Lost on TV. You know, you've seen the tropical island in the South Pacific 300 times since Far Cry kicked it off the first time. It's not exotic anymore. So how do we keep the game exotic? How do we stay true to that one really important thing? We have to go somewhere you've never been, somewhere that you know exists, somewhere that's real, and somewhere that you think you'll never get to go and, and has this hint of danger just built right into it. it took us quite a while. There's only five or six different kinds of places in the world that are like that, but Africa is definitely one. As soon as you see that, that sun over the grasslands, the acacia trees, and an AK-47 in your hands, you have it. You're there, so you're somewhere really rich, really exotic, really foreign, but really credible, and you immediately start to, get up, start to look over your shoulder and make sure that you're not in trouble. <laughs> Once you settle on, on Africa, we have the, the, the difficulty of, of setting the story there and, and, and tying that into. So how did you do that? Well, actually, actually, Africa was the keystone that started to put everything into place because we looked back at the original Far Cry and we said, okay, this is, this is the island of Dr. Moreau. This is, you know, a madman on an island trying to mix humans with mutants, okay? What does that mean for us in Africa and trying to focus on this realistic, exotic environment? And we realized, like, about the same time that H.G. Wells was writing Island of Dr. Moreau, Joseph Conrad was busy writing Heart of Darkness, which is, in some ways, is thematically similar. Very different books, you know. H.G. Wells is science fiction. Uh, Joseph Conrad is writing a book about the same kinds of things, how how human nature can be corrupted with, with savagery, and, and there's a madman in it as well with his own agenda. And we realize, like, okay, we're in Africa. We're, we're trying to hunt down a madman, just like in the original Far Cry. Uh, it's about who we are as humans and, and how close we are to animal, how we're just one step away from, from losing our, our minds and becoming... Maybe less than human, maybe more than human. It really depends on how you look at it. Uh, but without having to have that sort of science fiction flavor to it, because it, it's not necessary and it's not credible in our new environment. If you were to pick like one pivotal moment from from Far Cry 2 that that you would, that you feel is, is is descriptive of the whole feel of the game, what what would that be? <laughs> well, the game's not done yet, and the moments aren't uh, aren't planned and scripted in that sense. But uh, I'm pretty sure that that the first time that the player 
you know, gets a buddy, and the, the game is, the game is tracking his relationship with this buddy. The buddy's being implicated in missions. The player's helping the buddy. Uh, the buddy's helping the player. They're working together, maybe remotely, but the player gets to know this character. The first time that the player ends up in a situation where that buddy's in play, and there's a big mess, and he's got to complete an objective, and that buddy goes down, and he's lying there dying on the ground, and the player walks over to him and picks him up in his arms, and that guy, you know, has his last breath in your arms, and that guy's your friend. He's not, it doesn't, he's not your friend because you were told in a cutscene he's your friend now. He's a friend because you worked with him, and he worked with you, and you saved his life, and he saved your life, and you're working together, give or take, against this other force. When that character, when you lose that character, I think that's, that's, that's going to make you feel what Far Cry is really about. So why did you make the decision to go with only PC and not, not consoles? Um... I don't know that I made the decision. It was our mandate, right? It was Ubisoft wants to be recognized as a, as a premier PC developer, and they built a team specifically to make a PC game. Um, so that was my mandate from day one. I knew that when I signed on to the project. Um, in my mind, it doesn't really shape the way we do things too much. We just make the best game we can anyways. You might want to talk with the technical director. Obviously, there's a lot more stuff on his side that, that really is... PC specific. Um, I don't try to think about it too much. For me, um, for me, a platform is a platform. I'm really happy to have a super powerful platform to be able to say, I know that people will be able to play my game four years, five years from now, just like they, you know, you can play Far Cry now with everything turned up to maximum, and it's it's incredible. Um, so I'm happy to know that that my game is going to be obsolete. But other than that, it doesn't really affect the way I do my job too much. What would you say is the greatest challenge with an open-ended first-person shooter? What's what's the greatest challenge? for you? Um, there are a lot of challenges. Obviously, having to balance the freedom to explore and go where you want and, and do what you want to do versus what tends to be the case in a shooter, a constant forward pressure to move forward and complete objectives and move through the game, that's a really hard thing to balance off against each other. Uh, in some ways, I'm glad we're not the very first ones to do it. You know, there's been a couple other games that have come out recently that gave the player a lot more freedom in an open world, but still... Uh, uh, kept that pressure on him, notably, as I said, Boiling Point, uh, Stalker as well, um, open world games that, that really are shooters. Um, so, you know, we learned from them. Um, and aside from that, um, the hardest part about it really has nothing to do with, um, with, with the open world or the shooter part. The hardest part is to, is to make the player realize that this game, in my opinion, is is more than a shooter. It's not just a game where you run along in a line and kill people who are in your path. It's a game where you have a lot of freedom to determine how the story's going to unfold. It's a game where you need to where you will become emotionally invested in your relationships with characters. You know, that's one of the it's not just a mandate from Ubisoft to make a PC game. It's a mandate from Ubisoft to say all this stuff we say about our console games, about about our casual games, about games being for everyone. It's true, right? I want I want guys who are 35 and 40 years old who've been playing shooters for 20 years, and now they're like, yeah, I don't have time to play another shooter because they're still the same. Part of our mandate is to say, you know, you're, you're 35 years old, you're only going to play one or two shooters a year. This one you have to play because it's different. It's not the same game you played five years ago. The genre can evolve, and it can evolve a lot. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so... When can we look forward to playing Far Cry? So our target date is, is first quarter 2008. So like I said, we're not even alpha yet. We still have, uh, I don't even know what month it is. I'm so uh, scattered, something like eight or nine months or something before, uh, before, we're, uh, before we're into first quarter 08. So it's not super far away, but it's not super close either. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.